kindly put your phones on silent. To put their mobile phones on uh, silent mode, uh, please take uh, 20 seconds to do so now. Thank you for your cooperation. Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests. His Excellency Dr. Jamal Sanad Al Suwaid, Director General of the ECSSR, would like to welcome your presence amongst us to attend this lecture held by the ECSSR entitled The UAE and Australia a Roadmap for Future Cooperation. This uh, lecture comes at a time amidst a series of lectures held by the ECSSR where we are uh, really hosting a number of uh, VIP uh, figures because we are really celebrating uh, the 20th anniversary of the ECSSR. Ladies and gentlemen, the relationship, the Australian UAE relationship have developed to represent a very good model for Gulf Australian relations especially with the both parties being keen on promoting this relationship to build strategic partnership and the visit uh, of the IP figures from senior uh, uh, senior figures to us comes at a time to ascertain the strength of this relationship in this framework the UAE has signed a number of agreements cooperative agreements in different fields it is an honor uh, in this evening to welcome a very known figure uh, and who has a very uh, rich experience and who has played a very uh, 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 amazing role in Australia. I would like to welcome Her Excellency Julia Gillard, who will give a detailed uh, speech about the UAE and Australia a Roadmap for Future Cooperation. Your Excellency Julia Gillard, she is uh, the Prime, uh, former Prime Minister of Australia from the year 2010 until 2013. Uh, before that, she has been Deputy Prime Minister and she was the first woman to uh, have the position as prime minister and the first role as deputy prime minister. She has played during the financial crisis a very important role in providing a successful management of the 12th biggest economy in the world where she has implemented policies to make changes, reforming Australian education at every level from early childhood university education, creating an emissions uh, trading uh, scheme, improving uh, the provision and, uh, and sustainability of health care, aged care, dental care, and so on and so forth. She has strengthened her ties with India, Japan, Indonesia, and South Korea, as well as the United States. She represented her country at the G20 as well, including winning Australia's right to host the 2014 meeting for the East Asia Summit. Uh, APEC, NATO, and ESAF. Under Mrs. Gillard's leadership, she has been elected at the uh, uh, United Nations Security Council for the year 2012, and she has received worldwide attention for her speech in Parliament on the treatment of women in professional and public life. Ladies and gentlemen, it is an honor to welcome Her Excellency Julia Gillard to relay her speech about the UAE and Australia, a roadmap for future cooperation. You have the floor, Your Excellency. Please go ahead. Have you with us to, tonight? The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Mr. Ahmed, for that very kind introduction. Can I acknowledge Dr. Sanid al Suwaidi uh, here this evening, excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, one and all. It's a very great pleasure, indeed an honour, to be invited to address the Emirates Centre for Strategic Studies and Research. This centre is a very distinguished enterprise, which has as one of its core missions to stimulate discussion about the strategic signposts of our world today. To be asked to do something as big as that is a truly appreciated honour. 
I've been asked to speak about Australian policy towards the UAE and the Gulf. I will do so from my perspective of having led our nation for three years, but also mindful of the consistency that has been at the core of our relationship, a consistency of outlook, of strategic alignment, of deep friendship, of strong and growing commercial ties. Australia and the UAE are still headed down the road that was charted together many years ago, which found renewal and common purpose after 9-11, and which our leaders have in recent years deliberately moved towards broader horizons. In reviewing the diplomatic record over the past decade, the themes are consistent. First, a bilateral relationship that is dynamic and of strategic significance to both countries. Second, a commitment to trade and investment and a desire to broaden those ties. Third, an enthusiasm for strong people-to-people -people ties across many dimensions. And fourth, shared strategic interests in the security, stability and development of the Gulf region. As part of this strong architecture of ties between our countries, the UAE hosts the Australian Defence Force headquarters for the Middle East, our base which has been pivotal to our role in the war in Afghanistan, in aiding the fight against piracy in the Gulf of Aden and in strengthening maritime security in this region. I acknowledge the courage and commitment your nation has also shown in the fight in Afghanistan. Australia is truly thankful for this hosting and cooperation. I am personally thankful because as Prime Minister, I used the base on a number of occasions in order to visit our troops in Afghanistan. It is one practical expression of the friendship between our two countries. That friendship is also expressed in our growing economic relationship. I pay tribute to all those who are participating in the dynamic and growing web of economic and trade ties between our countries. Total joint trade now exceeds $5 billion annually. The UAE currently enjoys a slight trade surplus with Australia, so enjoy it while you have it because we intend to narrow it. While the UAE exports significant petroleum and related products to Australia, we have growing markets here in alumina, seeds, grains, fruit, meat and livestock, dairy, vegetables, and in passenger motor vehicles from Toyota's operations in our nation. But behind these numbers are two larger stories. First, they involve people. Over 16,000 Australians are living and working here in industries and economic sectors that are vital to the UAE's future. Health, education, financial services and construction. Indeed, the UAE is the 11th largest overseas host country for Australians in the world. I think we should jointly aim to see the UAE burst into the top 10. 350 Australian companies operate in the UAE and around 1,000 students from the Emirates study in our universities. I have to say that these ties are infectious because Abu Dhabi has even hosted Australian V8 supercars. Any two nations that can jointly enjoy V8 supercars <laughs> surely cannot have any strategic differences. As important as the V8 supercars are, aeroplanes are pretty important too. The airline of Australia, Qantas, in 2012, forged a strategic partnership with Emirates Airline and the result has been exceptional indeed. Passenger traffic at Dubai International Airport to and from Australia was up over 38% as a result of the tie with Qantas. Nearly 200,000 Australians visited Dubai in 2013. There are 140 flights per week between Australia and the Gulf. And in case you can't do the maths quickly enough, let me do it for you. That's one every 72 minutes. 
Etihad Airways and Virgin Australia are enjoying a partnership that is also showing great success with 28 weekly flights out of Abu Dhabi to Australia each week, and this year you will see the launch of new flights daily to Perth. This is solid growth that can only lead to more economic growth. There are also human ties in times of need. The people of Queensland have not forgotten, I have not forgotten, the very generous donation made in the wake of the devastating summer between 2010 and 11, when we endured floods and a cyclone in Queensland. I have not forgotten the $30 million do donation made by the Emirate of Abu Dhabi to build 10 Category 5 cyclone shelters that can protect up to 800 people in times of need. This was an extraordinary act of friendship from a good and trusted friend. On another front, Australia was well represented here last April at the Global Vaccine Summit, hosted by His Highness Sheikh Mohammed and conducted together with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. I was very pleased that our young Australian of the Year Akram Azimi, a refugee from Afghanistan who had been vaccinated by an Australian aid program, was able to attend. His experience shows that the world working together can eradicate polio. And I am proud that as Prime Minister, I ensured our nation made a substantial new commitment to this life-saving work. The second story behind the economic numbers is the diversification of both of our economies. For the UAE, a significant part of the future is an expansion of the economy from petroleum into a wider array of business activity. In this diversifying economy, and particularly in its services sector, especially education, Australia can play a larger role. We can help equip the next generation of Emiratis to build a more diversified economy at home. As the UAE endeavours to diversify its energy profile, we can also be proud of assistance given. In 2012, under my Prime Ministership, our two countries signed a nuclear cooperation agreement, enabling the UAE to become Australia's first Middle Eastern export market for uranium. This is a key building block on the UAE's goal of establishing a domestic nuclear industry later in this decade. This agreement also reflects the confidence we have in the UAE and its adherence to international norms regarding non-proliferation. This is a signal achievement. Underlying all of these practical outcomes of the friendship between our nations is a web of diplomatic dialogue that is of essential importance to both our countries. And I acknowledge that the Ambassador for Australia to the UAE is with us today. Our leaders and our ministers meet regularly. We are working towards a comprehensive free trade agreement between the Gulf Cooperation Council and Australia. I supported it as Prime Minister and I will support its successful conclusion under the current Australian Government. The UAE emphatically supported Australia's bid to win a seat on the United Nations Security Council and I want to thank the Foreign Minister, Sheikh Abdullah, for what he said in backing our bid in August 2012. We are now in our second year of service on that august body. Australia supported the permanent establishment of the headquarters for the International Renewable Energy Agency here in Abu Dhabi, where IRENA is now located. I am pleased that under the government I led, we first indicated to you our support for Dubai's successful World Expo 2020 campaign, and that the current government followed through with our vote. Our nations share a firm friendship. In an uncertain and often dangerous world, we have come to look to each other. Today, I want to canvas some of the challenges that confront us both in your region of the world and some of the ways our bond of friendship today can become even stronger for tomorrow. 
Our nations, our people want to live in peace and security, but we live in a world which requires us to confront some immense issues, very troubling issues, issues whose outcome is not clear, issues that quite frankly threaten the security, stability and prosperity of the entire world. Precisely because of the nature of those issues, it is important that, it's more important than ever before that our two countries work together. So let me turn to them and discuss them with you. First, Syria. This is the civil war that is breaking the hopes of everyone in the region. A tyrant is butchering his people. He has no compunction about using weapons of mass destruction to do it. The opposition is atomised and to a larger and larger extent, it is becoming radicalised. The tentacles of this war are spilling over into Iraq and Lebanon. All these factors together, Assad's entrenched power and willingness to go to any lengths to remain in power, the lack of any meaningful structure to reach a peace settlement that will create a new Syria, the different factions in the civil war and the risks of arming factions who would also pose a threat to peace and stability. All of these things have made a resolution extraordinarily difficult. Equally distressing is the immense humanitarian crisis that is getting worse. The burden on Jordan, Lebanon and Turkey is immense. Australia has contributed over $100 million to the relief effort and we keep pressing for access for humanitarian workers and supplies. We must remain open and vigilant to opportunities and strategies that will end the suffering, end the Assad regime and provide the path to a new Syria that can focus on rebuilding and not on threatening its neighbours. Second, Iran. For over a decade, our two countries have expressed in the strongest terms that an Iran with nuclear weapons is a grave threat to the security and stability of this entire region. And should Iran develop an intercontinental, intercontinental missile capability, a threat to virtually all nations. This we cannot accept. We have both supported strong sanctions at the United Nations. There is no doubt that they have had an effect on Iran's economy, that these sanctions are punitive and effective and have wedged open a door for diplomacy. But it must be recognised that you have paid a heavy price for it. With the sanctions in effect, commerce between the UAE and Iran has plunged 83% from $23 billion to just over $4 billion. The UAE is on the front lines and it is a big sacrifice. The P5 plus one interim agreement, whose implementation is just being finalised this week, is a first step in making this sacrifice worth it. It is now imperative that Iran follows through in both the letter and spirit of putting a halt to its nuclear programs. So I want to propose a corollary to President Reagan's famous dictum in reaching arms control agreements with the Soviets. He said, trust, but verify. But we can't trust the Iranians yet. Compliance with the interim agreement and all the enforcement provisions will test whether there can be trust. And so for now I say, hope but verify. There is no doubt that Iran's nuclear ambitions pose an existential threat to Israel, but they also pose the same threat to Muslim nations on this side of the Gulf. What is so interesting as we look at the interplay of forces and alignments is that all these countries, Saudi Arabia, Jordan, Egypt, the Emirates, Turkey and Israel, now share the same strategic interest, an Iran that does not have a nuclear weapon. Which brings me to a third major issue, the nexus between Saudi Arabia and the United States. I think it is important to go beyond the headlines and the public expression of irritation 
and focus on the larger strategic picture. Both nations want security and stability in the region. Both nations oppose Iran having a nuclear weapon. Both nations want a better outcome in Syria. Both nations oppose corrosion and terrorism in Lebanon. Both nations oppose the radical insurgency in Iraq and Syria. Both nations want a resolution at long last between Israel and Palestine. So I see these unfolding issues as ones of means, not ends. The UAE is a direct player here in the region. Australia is further away but has direct interests and we have committed our young men and women to defending and securing those interests too often at the price of the ultimate sacrifice. The best we can do for friends is to help friends advance their friendship and their alliance. We know we want America and Saudi Arabia to act in greater concord with each other precisely in order to change the trajectory of the threats that continue to emanate from this region. So let's help our friends act more in concert, more in harmony. Fourth, a few words on Israel and Palestine. My message to you this evening is the same as I delivered to an audience in Melbourne in November. I support a Palestinian state for the Palestinian people. I want to see the dawn of Palestine Independence Day. I want the Palestinian people to enjoy and pursue their destiny in full and to have a prosperous and successful country of their own, a nation they can call home at long last. But I also want to see Israel continue to pursue its destiny as it was conceived, as a Jewish state and as a democracy. Everyone talks about a two-state solution. I did consistently as Prime Minister. That is my view today. There is, there can be, no other course. Everyone understands a state for Palestine, but not everyone says there should be a state of Israel. Indeed, some countries, some leaders still want a world without Israel. Those are the words that come out of the lips of the leaders in Tehran and Gaza and southern Lebanon. I am convinced that the key to peace for Israelis and Palestinians is a simple declarative statement by Palestinian leaders that they accept Israel as a Jewish state. Once that is stipulated, then virtually everything else can be successfully negotiated because Israel's existential identity is successfully secured. Once that is stipulated, two great peoples can finally begin working together to build themselves up as an economic powerhouse in the region, as a wellspring of science and innovation, as leaders in agriculture, water conservation, solar power and renewable energy. Indeed, the list of potential shared areas of achievement is without end. This is an objective specifically endorsed by Secretary of State John Kerry in his marathon negotiations between Prime Minister Netanyahu and President Abbas. In New York in September, I visited with Martin Indyk, a son of Australia and one of our most accomplished diplomats and strategic thinkers. President Obama has entrusted him with the negotiations between Israel and the Palestinian Authority. He outlined to me the very tough nature of the issues and how they test the willingness and indeed the ability of the principles to reach deeply into themselves, to reach out to their constituencies and find the strength and the courage to make the hard decisions for peace at long last. But I know this, the keys to these locks are well known. They are lying on the table in President Clinton's cabin at Camp David. It's not the final choices that are so hard, what the border can be, what the land swaps will be, what arrangements can even be made in Jerusalem itself. No, it's not those decisions. It's the decision to do the deal, to do the deal which delivers two states for two people. There are so many other issues that engage and trouble us. The future for Egypt, violence in Libya, Al-Qaeda in Yemen, my message tonight as we survey this region from this vantage point is simply this. 
For all these issues, let's stay the course. Let's keep working together in a difficult and often dangerous world. Let's go the distance on diplomacy, vigorous and exacting diplomacy that keeps everyone honest and that is dedicated to real solutions to the real issues. An end to the civil war in Syria, the removal of Assad and the emergence of a new Syria focused on rebuilding and not terrorism or oppression. The removal of Iran's nuclear threat so that the entire region is safer and more stable and more secure. A renewal of a dynamic partnership between America and Saudi Arabia. A real peace between Israel and Palestine with a just, lasting and true two-state solution. And a joint continuing commitment by the UAE and Australia to work towards these noble goals, towards greater peace and security. Let me turn from the building of peace to the growth of prosperity. As the year begins, there are encouraging signs at long last of real traction in economic growth in the United States and an improved outlook in Europe. But there is much more that needs to be done to build global growth. I was very proud as Prime Minister to secure this year's G20 meeting in Australia. The world will rightly expect real results from that meeting with a focus on jobs and growth. Amongst a number of difficult issues to resolve is the renewal of the shared commitment to a standstill in protectionist measures. When I made my first contribution at a G20 meeting, I said that the real pressure on political leaders to deliver protectionist measures will not be in the depths of the global financial crisis, but during the long, hard climb to recovery. This is how it has proved to be and why a demonstration of global discipline in support of free trade is necessary at the G20. Similarly, the completion of the Gulf Cooperation Council FTA with Australia is of the highest importance. For both our countries, resources have been of immense importance, but diversification is key to our futures. For Australia, this means continuing our investment in infrastructure, innovation and productivity. It means continuing to see our agricultural assets, our clean, green food resources, together with the value add of food processing as a key way of generating wealth through trade into the Middle East and Asia. It means more mass and bespoke tourism experiences. It means more advanced manufacturing and a more sophisticated digital economy for the interconnected world of the 21st century. It also means that our two countries can join further together in cooperating on challenges like carbon and water scarcity. We can share expertise and experience as hot, dry energy exporters. For tomorrow, our friendship between our two nations can be strengthened by working together to build peace and prosperity. But as significant is working together as we invest in our people. Last month, General David Petraeus and former Ambassador Michael Guller, who served in Saudi Arabia and Bahrain, wrote in Politico, a Washington newspaper, and I quote, the social and political reforms taking place in the Arab monarchies of the Persian Gulf must rank with the significant overlooked developments in recent years. Since the Arab Spring began, in fact, the six member states of the Gulf Cooperation Council have launched numerous initiatives to open their societies to outside thinking and to improve the rights of women and religious minorities. They specifically cited numerous educational links between the UAE and Western educational institutions. How we invest in our people will determine our futures. On that, I believe our, nation can, our nations can learn much from each other. I am delighted that there are two outstanding Australian schools in the UAE, that Monarch, Murdoch University is here and the University of Wollongong is here, together teaching around 4,000 students. But I know 
that with your population's demographics and the growing numbers of young people, providing education of quality for all still looms as a key challenge. In my post-prime ministerial life, I have become a senior fellow at the global think tank Brookings, working on education. I acknowledge one of my colleagues who is here tonight, Mazer Jalbert, who's uh, in the audience uh, just there, Mazer. Uh, she works here and she is in the process of completing a major piece of work that charts the quality of education in the Middle East, including here in the UAE. Her results, which are soon to be launched, show that despite current efforts, too many children leave primary school and secondary school not having attained appropriate learning benchmarks. Mazer's work also shows that there is much we do not know about the performance of schools. So many big gaps in the data. As Prime Minister, my central passion was improving Australian education, and I know that passion drives many here in the UAE. A key element of my approach was recognising the force of the words that you can't fix what you can't measure. In Australia, this has led to a sophisticated and transparent system for measuring education outcomes, where results are available school by school to all. And those results can be understood in the context of the levels of advantage and disadvantage of children attending a school, and the levels of financing available for the education of the children in that school. Brookings has been facilitating the work of a high-level task force focused on this question of measuring the quality of learning globally. I am confident that there will be ways for the UAE and Brookings to collaborate and build on the excellent work that has been done by the task force. Imagine a future for school education here where the quality of what is happening in schools is transparent. Best practice can be shared, underperformance identified and addressed, financing provided in a way that meets need and drives quality up. Friends, let me conclude with the following observation. Whatever else 2014 brings us, it will bring us the 20th anniversary of the birth of this centre. Last month, your Director General held a major media event and said some very wise words. So rather than rewrite, I'm just going to quote. He said that the mission of this centre is to support national decision making and serve both the UAE and Gulf, the Gulf Cooperation Council societies in a manner that is mindful of tradition yet embraces modernity. So to the centre, I say, 20 years young, congratulations to all. Last year also brought us the 20th anniversary of the University of Wollongong in Dubai, the oldest Western university in the UAE. So 20 years that have seen a strengthening of the friendship between us. That's a track record to be proud of with a future full of promise for your centre, for our nations, and for our friendship. I thank you very much. Thank you, Your Excellency uh, Julia Gillard, for this very interesting lectures. You talk about the relation between UAE and Australia and how this relation is being growing and to the areas that we can develop and uh, improve the relation between both countries. Now uh, I'm glad to open the Q&A session and I'm sure the audience is looking forward to it. Before kindly I ask uh, who want to ask the question, please stand up to give us a chance to see him actually and also uh, introduce himself and make his question short as possible as. Dr. Abdurrada Asiri, you came from long distance. Then we will give you a chance. Uh, Abdurrada Asiri from uh, University of Kuwait, Kuwait. 
Frankly, I enjoyed your uh, speech. I appreciate what you've said, and I congratulate the center for having the 20 year anniversary. Well, I've got uh, one question and two foot, uh, footnotes. I would like you to enlighten me. As far as the UAE Australia relationship, or put it GCC Australia, well, you've got a strategic military and political relationship, but that is linked to issues that marginal to G GCC and marginal to UAE, Afghanistan, Somalia, Iraq, and others. What would you envision the future military political relationship between Australia on one side and GCC, including UAE? The second question, which is two parts, footnotes, I would like to enlighten us about the issue of the refugees, migration, and that issue that causes domestic uh, turmoil in Australia. And secondly, what happened to the demand some years ago that Australia become not a Commonwealth of Australia, but Republic of Australia? <laughs> Thank you very much. Ma Thank you. Uh, I, I feared Your Excellency when I saw you put your hand up that you were going to ask some hard questions and uh, my uh, fears have proved right, I, I feel. Um, I, I might uh, take them in reverse order. Uh, on the question of a republic, uh, we had a referendum some years ago and the nation voted no to change. Uh, now, actually, the majority of Australians, when polled, say that they do want Australia to become a republic, but there's been an absence of consensus about uh, how we do that, uh, so how we replace uh, the Governor-General with someone called a President and what the relationship of that person is to our Westminster system of parliamentary democracy. Uh, it was quite a hot debate. Uh, in the years that have intervened, uh, the years of the global financial crisis and so many other things in our world, the debate has receded in Australia. Uh, now, I personally think, um, you know, we will uh, become a republic. I'm sure that that will happen. Uh, the debate will have to come back on the agenda at some point. To be frank, I don't see that happening soon. I think people are focused on other concerns. Uh, there is also a great deal of respect and admiration in Australian society for Queen Elizabeth uh, and while she continues to be with us, and uh, long may that be, uh, and uh, given her uh, genetic heritage from her mother, that might well be a very, very long uh, period of time to come. Uh, but uh, I think whilst uh, the Queen is there, I doubt that the debate will happen with renewed force in Australia, so I think it will be quite some long time away. Uh, on the question of asylum seekers uh, who arrive by boat in Australia, this is uh, a big political debate in Australia and something that does deeply concern the Australian community. Uh, by the standards of the world, obviously, uh, we see relatively limited numbers of arrival. I spoke about the kind of refugee issues we're seeing from Syria into places like Lebanon. Um, and so, you know, when we've got nations around the world struggling with those huge refugee outflows, uh, by those standards, the number of arrivals in Australia is, of course, modest. Uh, but as an island continent, uh, it does discomfort people when people arrive unauthorised by boat uh, and, uh, tragically, uh, we've seen far too many people lose their lives trying to make the journey in what is a very dangerous stretch of water. Uh, so, between the humanitarian concerns and community concern, uh, Australia's been uh, endeavouring to work with the countries of our region, including Indonesia, uh, to uh, limit the number of people who take the risk and get on the boat. Uh, we do take, uh, per capita, a large number of refugees, uh, but the preference most clearly is, because it's the safest way for everybody involved, uh, that those refugees are processed by the United Nations High Commission and then received into Australia as uh, refugees and get to make a life for themselves. 
Um, in uh, the ongoing political relationship of our two countries, uh, the concerns that uh, we face in today's world, um, I, I wish I could uh, quickly see a future in which they are all resolved, Afghanistan, Iran, Syria. Uh, I fear that uh, these issues will be with us for some time to come, uh, and so our shared strategic outlook on them is significant. Uh, but in the happy days that may lie beyond uh, the resolution of all of those issues, I think Australia and the UAE will continue to need each other and to want to have a strong friendship. I think the nature of our economies will uh, always imply a compatibility and so there will be a strong economic link. Uh, I think the strong economic link will then help foster increased people-to-people -people links. Uh, and uh, wherever uh, in our world uh, there is trouble in the future, I think the diplomatic links will be strong enough that there is a very you know, great likelihood uh, that we will have a similar analysis of the problems and want to work cooperatively on the solutions. Thank you, Your Excellency. Yes. Uh, thank you very much, Excellency. It was a very informative thing which you have spoken. My question was... Uh, Can you introduce yourself yes, my first name is, where uh, you are? Yes, sir. My name is Rashid. I am embassy, uh, from Embassy of Pakistan. Pakistan. Uh, Excellency, you have mentioned about the U.S.-Saudi partnership, which is, of course, very meaningful. And uh, in some uh, context, we have seen that this partnership has really not worked well with uh, the Palestine-Israel dispute, and the results have not been as expected. Do you feel, in your opinion, is there any chance of uh, neutral powers like UAE, which has a very, very wide acceptability among the Muslim world, and Australia, which has again a very wide acceptability all over, so this kind of a partnership uh, can work on this uh, so, uh, rift or this uh, uh, conflict? Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, th thank you for the question. I think the uh, immediate focus uh, needs to be on the uh, negotiations that have been auspiced by Secretary of State Kerry and have brought the parties into dialogue uh, on what is uh, a tight timetable uh, and uh, I hope uh, that the tight timetable is held to and that we see some outcome from those discussions. Uh, for understandable reasons there's been an approach of confidentiality to those discussions so I think people are trying to find ground by keeping uh, the discussions basically within the room uh, but at some point uh, the uh, whatever has happened within the room uh, will become uh, public and there will be reactions from constituencies um, uh, amongst the Palestinian people, amongst the people of Israel uh, and in other parts of the world. Uh, and at those, that point, I believe, uh, countries of goodwill uh, can make a difference to the way in which those uh, discussions happen next. Uh, there will you know, be uh, many points of stress and strain and I think countries of goodwill can assist when those points of stress are um, absolutely in focus and that will happen in the course of these discussions. Yes, please. Hello, um, my name is Echo Nelson, I work for Ericsson. Um, I'm gonna thank you very much for a very wonderful speech anyhow. Um, I'm gonna ask you a question in your role as a fellow of the Brookings Institute, thank you. rather than as ex-Prime Minister. <laughs> <laughs> um, do you, to what extent do you think the discovery of shale gas and uh, fracking and the energy independence it promises will alter the geopolitics of the region, and in particular, the US relationship with the region. Okay. 
I'm, I'm happy to answer that question, but I'll do it personally on my own behalf, uh, rather than with the uh, Brookings banner, because uh, obviously as a think tank, uh, Brookings brings together a lot of smart people, in fact, very smart one, Mesa is sitting right behind you, um, but uh, there's, there's not an established Brookings view on questions such as this, so I'll, I'll speak personally. Uh, my uh, sense is, uh, whilst of course the shale gas revolution uh, has changed the reliance of the US on imported energy, uh, so it's been able to generate more of its domestic energy. Uh, the reality for the US and for nations around the world uh, is that we are going to need access to multiple energy sources because energy demands keep growing um, in, in, around the world. Uh, at the same time, uh, we are trying to decarbonise our economies or at least reduce the amount of carbon that our economies generate. Uh, so in those circumstances, I think people will be looking for a secure energy mix. Uh, so no one will be able to say uh, that all of their energy eggs are in one basket. Uh, so I think that's the sort of energy policy outlook. Uh, I think it would be an error uh, to conclude that the US's only strategic frame for engagement in the region is through the frame of its energy needs. I think the US strategic frame for the region uh, is about uh, the world's peace and stability. Uh, and so even if, uh, you know, magic happened and suddenly everybody's energy needs were resolved uh, and people weren't on the hunt for energy around the world, I think you would still see the US deeply engaged in the region. Thank you. Yes, please. The, uh, the lady. My name is Jessica Tattersall and I'm from Sydney, but I'm studying at New York University in Abu Dhabi. Oh. I was also going to ask about the Republic issue, but I have another equally important question for you, which is what do you think it will take for us to see our next female prime minister come into power? <laughs> Uh, well, we've, uh, we've just had an election, so, you know, we've got a bit of time to wait, um, and uh, at the next election we'll see uh, uh, Prime Minister Abbott and Bill Shorten contending for the Prime Ministership. Uh, my, uh, my own view about, you know, change in politics and women in politics, uh, and this has been my view for a long period of time, uh, we can't afford for the dialogue to be about, you know, the one. Is there the next one woman who could be uh, Prime Minister and then, you know, put a lot of burden on the shoulders of an up-and-coming woman because she gets framed as the, you know, golden girl and pedestals are high and they're pretty painful to fall off. So I think that's the wrong approach. Um, I think the right approach is to uh, look for... Uh, you know, measures to keep changing the mix of our parliament. So we move from where we are at the moment with about a third uh, of the Senate being women and about a quarter of the House of Representatives being women uh, to a stage where uh, it's basically 50-50, it's half-half. Uh, if you got to that stage and you imagined front benches on both sides of politics, uh, which were half men and half women, uh, then if you have that number of women uh, there at the forefront of politics, when political parties come to choose their next leader, uh, it is uh, more and more likely that that next leader will be a woman. Uh, what I think is uh, disappointing, and I made this disappointment clear at the time, uh, that we moved from a situation where um, I was Prime Minister, but even put me to one side, where we had uh, a strong number of women in Cabinet, I mean, forming, um, uh, performing very important roles for the government uh, and we've gone so far backwards that now we only have uh, one woman in Cabinet. Of course, Ms Bishop is performing a very important role for the government, uh, but uh, to, to have gone so far backwards in just one 
turn of the political cycle, uh, I think is uh, very disappointing. And what we need to see is change on both sides of politics uh, so that there are more women and more possibilities for the future. Yes, uh, also the lady. And we will come back to you. Good evening, I am Maria Gonzalez from the Business Year. I would like to know, um, you name in your, uh, you said in your lecture that is 350 companies based here in the UAE. I would like to know what are the main advantages in the UAE for Australian investors? And I would, like, uh, I would also like to know, uh, you talk about education in your lecture, and I would like to know what will be the next initiatives that Australia will take in the UAE? Which ones will be done? Thank you. Mm. Uh, well, I, I can't give you a complete answer to, uh, to both questions because obviously these uh, decisions, uh, the decisions made by businesses, the decisions made by our educational institutions are made by them uh, rather than you know, by government. But to give some insights into what I think uh, would guide their thinking, uh, for uh, you know, businesses seeking to invest in the UAE, uh, I think the uh, fact that it is already um, you know, known terrain, uh, that there are so many companies here, that there are so many Australians here, that there are so many good transport links between our two countries, obviously makes it um, an easier choice uh, for investment than perhaps looking towards a nation uh, where there is less known and less familiar familiarity by the Australian business community. Uh, now, what would ease the way, of course, would be a free trade agreement that helped to ease some blockages in trade and in, and in investment. And I'm sure uh, many pe business people in the UAE would say, well, that's a reciprocal uh, turn because it would make it easier for them to invest in Australia. Uh, on our education institutions, the fact that there have been uh, you know, there are two universities present here. One has been present here for so long. Uh, the fact we've got, I think, around a thousand Emiratis studying in Australia, uh, that known exchange and presence, I think, makes it easier to keep building. Uh, we would obviously want to see more students come to Australia, more Australians come here. Uh, so that really is about the uh, you know, entrepreneurship and uh, spirit of engagement uh, between Australian universities, universities here and our two nations. And so I think that um, kind of mix is there and can be built upon. Uh, the scholarship settings of the Australian government matter. Uh, we had a range of uh, scholarship settings, uh, not only for people to come to Australia, but for Australians to go and study overseas. I know that the incoming government has got some like policies, so that obviously assists as well. Uh, the gentleman there in the middle. Good evening, Julia. Welcome to the UAE. Thank you. Uh, my name is Donald Barber. I work for the um, Men's College, Higher Men's College. Um, two questions. One, what can we do to make the Australian dollar more competitive? <laughs> and two, do you think Australia should have a five-year term instead of a three-year parliamentary term? Uh, um, right. Well, I was going to award hard questions of the night down here, but I think I'm, in, I'm about to shift my view. Um, the, uh, on the Australian dollar, because we have a, uh, you know, a free floating currency, um, it uh, replicates what's happening in global markets. And yes, the Australian dollar was very uncomfortably high. Uh, for a lot of the period of my Prime Ministership, there's been uh, started to be some adjustments down and, and you would have been aware of that. But when we were trading at uh, above parity with the US dollar, um, that put a lot of pressure on. Now, 
a strong dollar uh, is depends on your perspective. You know, for Australians who are travelling overseas, they love a good, strong Australian dollar. It means when they come to the UAE that things are comparatively cheaper for them. Uh, if you're running a manufacturing business in Australia, an Australian dollar above parity with the US dollar can break your business model. Uh, and we saw that happening with a number of uh, export-oriented industries. Uh, the strength of the Australian dollar was contributed to by a few factors. Um, our strength coming out of the global financial crisis, uh, the comparative weakness of other economies, particularly the US, uh, the resources boom, uh, an increasing view that we were a safe haven currency. Uh, all of these things uh, contributed to the pump of the dollar. Uh, those things in some measure are going to persist for some period of time, uh, but as the US economy comes back into a stronger and stronger cycle, then the, uh, you would expect the differences uh, between our dollar and their dollar to be back in the US's favour, and we're increasingly seeing that. Um, on your second question about five-year terms, uh, I... I understand intellectually the argument that a longer cycle is better in politics um, and of course we've seen state governments move to four-year terms uh, but I think given the nexus with the Senate uh, it is very unlikely that we will see movement federally. Uh, I think people might well say well yes you know a longer term for government makes sense but then by the time you were talking about 10-year Senate terms which you would be if you had five-year House of Representatives terms. I think people would say electing someone for 10 years is too long. Uh, then if you said, well, let's change the whole system and vacate the whole Senate uh, every election, uh, through the maths of how double dissolutions work, you'd be reducing the quota, you'd be seeing more and more minor parties elected to the Senate. Uh, with more and more unpredictability about what then happens with the legislation. And so the certainty you've bought in the lower house through a five-year term might well be paid for by more uncertainty in the Senate, and I don't think people would like that. Uh, so I really just don't see change happening in our federal cycle. Thank you. Yes, please. My name's Tom Taylor, I'm, we're from uh, the same city, from Adelaide, um, and I'm also a student here at New York University in Abu Dhabi. Uh, at the moment there are, there's a heat wave that is, is um, sweltering in Adelaide and, and there are um, climate records constantly being broken around the world and, and, and what experts are calling climate disasters um, on, a, on an increasingly um, regular basis. What do you think it will take uh, for there to be a global commitment um, that is tangible and not just rhetorical on um, to take action uh, against climate change? Mm. Well, I don't think uh, you can, for, for any one weather event, uh, I don't think you can put the one weather event down to climate change, but you're absolutely right when you look at the averages of what's happening with our weather, the um, extreme weather events, uh, the global warming is obvious and I 100% accept the science and believe it's um, really beyond uh, human reason that people don't accept the science. Um, I think, you know, if we're just looking at our world today, I. Uh, I play words with friends, uh, with some friends around the world, a Scrabble game online, and you can have little messages alongside. I play with a friend in New York who keeps typing the words polar vortex into the little message thing on the, on the side, as I keep typing the words heat vortex back to her. Uh, so we are seeing some very extreme weather events around the world. Uh, for greater global commitment uh, to reducing carbon, uh, I'm actually an optimist and I think uh, whilst uh, it always, um, you know, multilateral negotiations are always difficult, I think we did see some progress in multilateral negotiations post-Copenhagen. 
uh, I think we could see some more progress as people start to make good on their commitment to have agreements uh, that would make a difference uh, from uh, 2015 on. Uh, now, the test of all of that is still to come through the discussions across this year, uh, but I am still an optimist that the world will come together and address what is uh, quintessentially a global challenge. Uh, it requires people to accept the science, it requires people to accept the economics, that a price on carbon and a market-based mechanism is the cheapest way of reducing carbon pollution. Uh, you know from our own country that we struggle with some of the dialogue around this domestically. Uh, the world struggles with it too. Uh, but I think you know, the, the inevitable force is towards more and more progress and more and more agreement on action on climate change. Thank you. Your Excellency, I thank you for a very, an excellent speech. But and if uh, you ask you to introduce yourself. Um, you Sheikh Al Maskari from Abu Dhabi. Yes. And I spent a lot, of a lot, a long time in Australia, in Melbourne actually, uh, 40 years ago. Uh, so uh, I'm very familiar with Australia. I'll go back to the factors you're mentioning. You mentioned about strategic uh, and economic cooperation, and I was very much touched with the third factor, is the closeness of the people. And with that, it is very, to me, is a very significant factor that uh, there is a lot in common for, by nature of the people of the UAE and the GCC and actually the openness and sincerity of the people of Australia we feel very comfortable. And this actually the binding uh, matter that really uh, can solve a lot of issues. The, also the importance of MRC line joining with countries, because mm. it really before, I, I used to feel that Australia was uh, giving as a little bit of a cold shoulder in the Gulf because of the distance and your proximity with Southeast Asia, particularly with the resources of Australia, minerals resources, and the open market of China and Japan and Southeast Asia. But Qantas Airline, uh, uh, joining with Emirates Airline, that has really, in, really made a lot of difference to tourism, which is the one way of joining the people and uh, facilitating easier trade between the two countries. And there is a, uh, I expect a lot of developments, bilateral developments by that. And the third issue that was asked, besides uh, the economic cooperation, and uh, someone asked about uh, any military uh, in the future between the GCC and Australia, uh, and I see that we have a lot of in common because of our British colonialism heritage. We have the common language and the common educational base, common understanding. And with that, we have, uh, uh, in the event of any threats, we usually have, uh, so far, we have had very common stand. So that uh, behoves us to think that in any time in the future, as you said, if needed, we usually turn up to be in agreement. But uh, also an important thing that I think you mentioned that I would like to point out is that just yesterday, the UEE uh, announced a seven-year strategic plan. And healthcare and education are the two most important factors of that. And there is a great potential for cooperation in those two strategic plan development plans between the UAE and Australia. Thank you. Well, I, I really just agree with all of those words. I think uh, there's plenty of uh, uh, potential for cooperation on uh, public policy questions in education and health as well as uh, service provisions uh, issues. Uh, and on people-to-people -people links, there's uh, no substitute really for people being able to say, 
uh, when they, you know, watch the news and there's something on the news about the UAE to be able to turn to the person next to them and say, I've been there. Uh, and more and more Australians will be able to say that uh, because of the links uh, that both Qantas and Virgin have formed. They will say, oh, I've been there, I know something about it, I met someone there, I had this conversation, uh, and all of those human interactions in their thousands and then hundreds of thousands and ultimately millions uh, end up to be a very big uh, factor in a friendship between two countries. Thank you, Your Excellency. We will take a last question from the back. Yes. Uh, thank you very much indeed. Uh, welcome to UAE. Uh, my name is Ahmed Shikara, and ECSSR. Uh, my question is like this. Um, you know, you have one, at one time ANZAS uh, as a pact between Australia, and New Zealand, and the US. Uh, and it's a dormant institution almost. So do you think there is a chance to reactivate this strategic alliance so that it could cooperate in partnership with GCC uh, on security, regional security issues? Uh, and I don't know how uh, you, ha you, you characterize your relations with New Zealand in, in the sense that both of you are close neighbors and contiguous uh, places. Uh, what kind of a role New Zealand should have in this uh, partnership? Thank you very much. Mm. Uh, well, I think the best way of characterising our relationship with New Zealand is uh, they're like family, uh, which doesn't mean that we don't, uh, you know, play out our arguments, particularly on the sporting field, and we absolutely hate it if New Zealand wins. And unfortunately, with monotonous regularity in some sports, they do. Um, but, uh, <laughs> uh, Eve, all right, we've got a Kiwi here, I can tell. Um, uh, but yes, definitely like family. Uh, I mean, in terms of uh, ANZUS, our alliance with uh, the United States, uh, it's, it's not, I mean, it's not a question of activating that uh, to uh, engage with uh, the Gulf Cooperation Council and, you know, m more specifically with the UAE. Uh, it really is about uh, countries coming together, the US, Australia, uh, New Zealand, uh, whoever, else uh, wanted to be involved and, uh, you know, having discussions and making decisions. Uh, so we do, uh, you know, with uh, countries in our region and more broadly, uh, engage in military cooperation. Uh, that ha does happen here with the UAE, uh, and I'm sure that that will continue for the future. Okay, I will give a chance for a lady also. The last question will be. Hi, my name is Megan Eloise. I'm a student from New Zealand at New York University, Abu Dhabi. Um, I'm glad you're acknowledging our superiority in the sporting field, but... Um, <laughs> My question is, you've talked about the importance of Australia embracing an equal proportion of women to men in leadership, and I was wondering how you foresee that evolving in terms of women's leadership in this region? Uh, well, uh, it, you know, it's uh, not, not for me uh, to, uh, you know, determine how uh, countries and individuals approach these issues. People will think them through for themselves. Uh, but if you're asking me what are my values and what drives me and what's my perspective on the world, uh, my perspective on the world is that uh, men and women are equal in every respect uh, and that uh, that means for societal organisations, whatever uh, aspect of society we're looking at, whether that's uh, business or uh, government decision making, uh, or civil society organisations or legal systems uh, that ultimately that should rep replicate and represent the equality between men and women. Uh, and I think that that is both a question of uh, philosophy and human rights, uh, but it's also a question of capacity. Uh, because if you believe, as I do, that merit is equally distributed between the sexes uh, and you look at institutions that are predominantly 
male, uh, then that does mean that there are a lot of women of merit who aren't getting to show their talents and capacities. Uh, I think uh, all of these questions are uh, pressing in our world, in, in they're, they're always pressing questions, but they're also in our world, in our economies, in the economies that we will live in in the future, the economy that uh, uh, you'll uh, grow to see and work in, obviously being a younger person when people like me are well and truly put out to pasture. Um, the the uh, world you'll live in is one where the premium for economies will be on knowledge and innovation, uh, and so people won't be able uh, to take their full place in that global economy uh, unless they are relying on the skills and capacity of all of their people because all of the brain power uh, will be needed to hold your competitive position in that world. And this uh, answer uh, wrap up our event for tonight. Once again, I thank Her Excellency Julia Gillard for this great presentation. And uh, also I thank all of you for your, uh, the, for your uh, insurance uh, tonight discussion. On behalf of Dr. Jamal, and my college at ECSSR, I thank you for attending this lecture. And I kindly invite everyone to the reception outside. And also I want to invite you for our next lectures, which will be on next Sunday, 19th January, uh, delivered by uh, Dr. Al Khadr Abdul Baqi. He is the head of the Nigerian uh, Center for Strategic Studies, and he will talk about the Islamic militant in Africa. Thank you, and good night.